Yeah, because it's very interesting for me when you spoke about dealer groups coming in and setting up distribution of vehicles themselves and managing brands themselves, because we've started to see some of that already. And I think that I think you're right with them being sort of vertical integration. It might make a lot of sense for those dealer groups to say, okay, well, we we have got 200 dealers or so many dealers. 500 dealers or whatever the number is, it's worthwhile for us to go and get these brands. We manage that whole sales process from beginning to end. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens along that space. Correct. And it's 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 actually doing the reverse of what the OEM is doing to the dealer, where the OEM is saying, oh, we're going to get an agency, so we're the OEM. We'll bring the stock in and we'll sell to the customer and give you some money. The dealers, the dealer groups going over and saying, well, okay, we'll sign up with brand X and we'll bring it in, guaranteeing volumes, because the factory will say, okay, you need to guarantee its volume. So the volume plan may be, I don't know, 10,000 cars for the year and say, or 1,000 a month. So let's say 12,000 cars. We want to sell 1,000 a month just to start with. So you have to buy 1,000 cars from us. We'll produce them. You tell us what, they, what colors you want, whatever configuration, but you have to take 1,000. So the factory will build 1,000. The dealers take it, they go, right, we'll place it in amongst our group. They then take the OEM out of the cha- out of the link. So there's actually a better drink in it for the dealer because, okay, they're, they're making the margin straight from the factory and selling it without having the importer in the middle. So that's a that's a, a reverse flip, if you like, and it's quite a, a, a clever one. But uh, you know, one that you know, would never have been thought of in the old days because you had the OEM saying, "Well, we've got a sales company. You buy from the sales company. You know, this is the dealer agreement. You have to comply to our rules." Whereas if you're dealing with a merchant who just makes stuff and sells it and leaves it to you to distribute it and stays arm's length, that's great <clears throat> because then you can make more money as a group. You're aware of the risk. Yeah, because that makes a lot of sense because they're closer to the market, so they should be having a better feel for what what the market wants. Because that's always a complaint. The dealer's always saying, you know, you guys are always ordering the wrong stock from an OEM point of view. And you're getting the wrong stuff. So that will make them be because they're closer to the market and make them because they'll be more more responsible for it. So it's quite it could be a model that could work pretty well if you think about it. The downside is the majority of de- and that's why the dealer groups are getting more sophisticated. So you actually need, ironically, you need some ex OEM people in those larger dealer groups or ex management people in those dealer groups that aren't traditional DPs. DPs you need to operate the day to day, but when you get into the the strategic and senior operational, you need to have operatives that are thinking macro. And thinking six, 12 month lead time, lead times in the strategy, in the planning and the execution. Because we all know that, you know, we've we've been I've worked in dealer land, you've worked in dealer land, John. You know, in dealer land, it's a it's a 30 day cycle. What do we need for this 30 days? Oh, and, and it's there's limited planning beyond that. Okay, yes, there will be deal, there'll be business plans. Ideally, but ultimately, really, it's a 30-day cycle. It's like, got too much stock, not enough stock. And you quickly blame the factory. You don't have the right stock that I need. Or what did you order three months ago, four months ago, five months ago? So those disciplines have to be brought into those groups to do that. So you can't rely on the guy who just goes, oh, today we need this. Oh, where's my red ones? I've so- we sold five red ones yesterday, but you know, I didn't think we'd ever sell five red ones, but now I need more red ones. Why don't we have any? Well, if you're in charge of it, you know, well, geez, there you go. I now realize. That was unusual. We sold five red ones. We can't get another five red ones for another three months. Okay, so therefore we'll just take forward orders or we'll do whatever. But you're right, there's more margin potentially available to the dealer groups becoming the importer. But then there's the hassles of homologation and compliance. So you got to do that too. So that's why you need another layer within the group to do that. But once again, you get it right, you can make a lot more money. 
With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Because that's interesting because it's going to be... Because if the dealer groups start doing that, it's going to put more pressure on the importers who have traditionally picked up all these little brands. Right. Now the dealers are saying, well, we're happy to do that ourselves. So the traditional importing companies are going to be put under a different perspective of pressure. Right. Because they're not going to have as many brands available to them. Because there's always, you know, how many of those little brands are there in this? 12, 15 of those little brands that get shared out amongst those four or five importing companies. So now suddenly they're going to be under pressure. And then should that arise, should the, a group take on board the distribution, then you've got the problem if you're not one of those brands, if you're a brand that, that is a small little OEM that's decided to come into this country, you're now competing against the big boys of OEMs that would want to crush you, that don't want to let you in their showrooms. We've all been in that situation. We've been a big, big, big bad OEM saying, no, 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 you can't be in my, not in my showroom, buddy. Piss off. Uh, but we've also been the small challenger one saying, hey, can we just get a square of this showroom that's not getting much traffic? We just want to have a little bit. Uh, and then it's it erodes the uh, experience of the bigger brand. We sort of piggyback off the bigger brand. Uh, so you've got that as a challenge, but then you've got the other side of it, which is, the dealers who are the groups that are bringing in the products, they all want to promote theirs ahead of yours. So, you know, how do you get that share of attention from the supply chain, the distribution chain, I should say, not supply chain, your sales channel, because you need to over-represent yourself versus the dealers. And that's one thing, getting to answer your question before about what do you do if you're one of those challenger brands? You need to make sure that if you are in the de- dealer uh, distribution model that you are so you are so getting your unfair share of attention in every retail outlet possible, so that you're the you 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 get more of the attention than what you really deserve or earn. Mm-hmm.